and welcome everybody welcome back to this uh, new chapter in herbert's course and today he's going to to talk about how what insight can we get uh, from navier stokes equations or from fluid mechanics principles into these complex coral ecosystems that he's showing in the first slide so please remember that you could ask questions in the chat box and then I will I will bring that to the attention of Herbert. Or if you feel appropriate, you can actually unmute your mic and ask the question directly. Okay, so Herbert, thank you again for being with us and please start. Okay, well, thank you very much, Sergio. Um, Good day, I should now say to everybody as I realize the, the different times and uh, thank you very much for uh, joining. Uh, and as Sergio said, today we're going to talk about Stokes Drift, uh, an interesting idea that I'll bring in uh, in oceans uh, that are above coral reefs, as you see here. And I'm going to explain some of the physical and biological significance of this uh, Stokes Drift. And then that's going to lead me or led me to an idea about how to defend against tsunamis, which are really disastrous uh, events that happen on the main ocean. Uh, here's a picture of a coral uh, reef. Uh, you see it's really quite heterogeneous, uh, lots of different relatively small forms of coral. This will go down to quite some depth and horizontally it will go on for kilometers and kilometers. Okay, well, the uh, uh, contents of what I'm going to talk about today, first I'll tell you a little bit about the uh, background, then I'll explain the fluid dynamics to you, then I'll tell you about some field data that uh, confirms what uh, the fluid dynamics theory predicts, tell you about some laboratory experiments, and then we'll have some uh, conclusions. And uh, as Sajir said, please do interrupt or put uh, questions in the chat box. But one of the difficulties of a Zoom talk is that I can't see any of you. So I don't know how you're taking the talks, whether you're understanding them, whether there are some things I haven't said that uh, clearly talking to a live audience is very much uh, better. I always uh, react to according to who I'm talking to. Okay, well, here are some waves. You see some long crested waves. Um, one, two, three, four of them, uh, really. Some also very small surface tension influenced uh, ripples on the waves, but uh, that's not important. It's the long crested waves that <clears throat> I want to talk about that propagate uh, along. These are small sloped waves, meaning that the ratio of the amplitude to the wavelength is relatively small. And so they can be described to some extent by linear theory. And when you look into the linear theory, uh, writing down the equations that we've talked about already, the Bernoulli equation at the uh, free surface and uh, the uh, high Reynolds number problem because viscosity doesn't play a role in the interior, you get a dispersion relationship which relates the frequency omega and the wave uh, length lambda, which is given the inverse two pi over lambda is given as the wave number k. And that important dispersion relationship is omega squared equals gk tanch kd, where d is the depth of uh, the ocean and g is of course uh, gravity. So that's the important relationship that links the frequency to the wavelength. Now what's important is the velocity at which the, phase, the phases go, in other words, the maximum or the minimum, uh, and that's omega over k, and then just uh, from the dispersion relationship above, you get the relationship that uh, you see here, this function to the square root. Now if the depth is very much larger than the wavelength, um, in other words, uh, KD is uh, large and tanch um, can be approximated by just one. 
then you have that the phase velocity uh, it goes like g over k uh, to the one half uh, power. So that's for deep uh, oceans. Now that's one velocity. That's the phase velocity. That's the velocity at which the maxima or the minimum uh, go. But now there's another velocity, very important, which is the group velocity, which is the rate at which the energy propagates or a group of waves will go. But it's better to remember, I think, is the, which the energy propagates. And it's equal to d omega dk. Uh, dimensionally, that's uh, correct. Uh, but the differential of uh, omega with respect to k, where you have the uh, relationship between omega and k on the uh, third uh, line there. And when the depth is uh, very large, that's about half the phase velocity. So the velocity at which the energy goes, the group velocity, is for deep uh, waves or waves on deep surface, only half at which the phases go. Now you can tell that uh, if you drop a stone into a pond, um, waves will be excited. And if you look at the front wave, it goes along and then it disappears. And what was the second wave becomes the first wave. And it goes along and it disappears too. And then what was the third wave becomes the front wave. That's because the energy propagates at half the rate when it deep of uh, the phases and the energy uh, doesn't propagate fast enough to keep up the first wave and, and then not fast enough to keep up the second wave. So those are the two important linear um, velocities, the phase velocity and the group velocity determined by solving just the linear equations and making uh, the assumption that the amplitude divided by the wavelength is small. And you see the amplitude doesn't come in here at all. It's all uh, linear uh, theory. Herman, if I, if I may ask something here. Please. When you say linear equations, then obviously this is not coming from Navier-Stokes. This is the wave equation? This, so is, wave equation? this is the high Reynolds number uh, equation, which says we won't take viscosity into account. The divergence yes. of the velocity is equal to uh, zero. And that says uh, that uh, uh, you can write the velocity in, in terms of the gradients of the potential phi and okay. that leads to because div u is zero that del squared phi is equal to zero so it's solving the laplacian within the uh, water and then bernoulli's theorem telling you how the pressure uh, it, which is going to be constant on the water surface uh and solving that okay thank you okay well thank you very much for interrupting please uh, do so now, George Gabriel Stokes, very important and influential uh, scientist um, who uh, lived for quite some time, as uh, you see, um, <clears throat> some 94 years. And he was the Lucasian professor for 54 of those years. It's remarkable these days, the University of Cambridge, at least, uh, against uh, the law of the land, asked people to leave at 67. So I've been forced to retire. But uh, he was a very important uh, person. At one stage, he was president of the Royal Society. Uh, the Lucasian professorship he held for so long, most recently, or one of the most recent holders has been Stephen Hawking. And in those days, the university had a member of parliament as well as the town. So if you were a university lecturer and lived in Cambridge, you voted once for your university member of parliament and once for your local member of parliament. Quite strange. Anyhow, Stokes said, what happens if we take the next term in those equations? What will we find? If we, we've done the linear evaluation, now, as you see, the A squared term here uh, says that it goes like the square of the amplitude of uh, the wave. Um, a, a times K is assumed to be small. 
um, but now we multiply that small parameter by a um, and we get what's known as the Stokes drift. So that says that slowly to second order, slowly there's a drift of fluid particles um, the decreases with the depth, as you see here, it's e to the z on uh, lambda, e to the four pi z on lambda. So that says as uh, z goes to minus infinity right at the bottom of uh, the uh, fluid, it's uh, really very, very small, exponentially small. Now, this Stokes drift is purely horizontal. second order in amplitude A, um, with, uh, the, which is important because that's how it's derived, and there's an exponential decay with the depth. It's very important because this is the fluid motion that brings, for example, driftwood to uh, shore uh, due to Stokes drift and, and moves plastics around the ocean, for example. Slowly, slowly, by Stokes drift, fluid moves around. Now, but what about if you have waves over a coral layer? And I've shown it uh, here, a, a sketch of it. And as always, I'll tell you what the uh, equations are, but I won't do all the algebra of uh, solving uh, them. In the... Uh, fluid upper layer, which is the depth little d, um, you use the Euler equation, i.e. no viscosity, uh, and um, Bernoulli's equation on the free surface saying how the change must be so that the uh, pressure on the free surface remains constant. And then in the coral layer below, we're going to use it as flow through a porous media, which we've talked about, and we're going to use Darcy's law. So we use Darcy's law in the lower layer, um, and we uh, use Euler and Bernoulli in viscid fluid in the upper layer. And then we want to know what's that going to be uh, like and, and do the analysis. Now, there's quite a bit of mathematics involved here, and as I say, that would take easily the whole hour to go through. So I'm just uh, leaving you uh, with these statements. And as I said, as Laplacian of in water layer, I don't know what Laplacian in the water layer and Bernoulli at the surface, I don't know what the of means there. Um, the Darcy in uh, the porous layers, I've already said, and then we match at the porous layer, water layer interface to make sure that whatever happens there is uh, continuous. And then of course, there's, as I say, Bernoulli at the surface. Now that must lead to a dispersion relationship, a relationship between the frequency and uh, the wave uh, length. So this is the dispersion relationship. The one in blue uh, is what uh, you get. Uh, so you see the d minus little d comes in because that's uh, what uh, is uh, going on in the porous uh, medium. And uh, then you have this uh, relationship on the right-hand side. And the most important thing in some sense is that there's an i here, square root of minus one, uh, which already tells you that the k the wave number, because that's what this is about, it relates the wave number to the frequency is going to be, have a real part and an imaginary part because there's a, a, an imaginary number I on the right-hand side. Now it's worthwhile non-dimensionalizing this and we'll talk about non-dimensional quantities. And so I've written in uh, more or less purple, uh, the non-dimensional representation of uh, that uh, um, dispersion relationship. So it's S that uh, um, is 
omega squared d over g, and the s is a non-dimensional parameter, as is the r, which is the wavelength, uh, the wave number k, which as I've said, is going to be complex because the form of the dispersion relationship, that means that the waves are going to decay with time a little bit, um, <clears throat> non-dimensionalized with the total depth d. Delta, which is little d over big D, is the height of the uh, fluid layer to the total uh, depth. And J is this important non-dimensional quantity, which is an input uh, to the system, if you like, which is the um, parameter describing the coral layer, which we've uh, described just as a porous media, times the frequency divided by the fluid viscosity. So the fluid sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but there, there is a question for you Yeah, in the chat box. Okay, can I, how do I see the chat box? Um, or if the person that is asking could unmute the mic. Sorry, uh, how, but how, suddenly my chat box doesn't want to work. Why is that? Do uh, I have to stop sharing? Uh, I can uh, ask the question, uh, uh, Kali. Uh, you said the uh, we match uh, between uh, the porous layer and the water layer. Uh, what needs to be matched? Is it just the velocity or are any other quantities? That's no, it also has to be the pressure, the perturbation. Okay. Yeah. Uh, whoops. How, how do I get back to uh, share screen? Uh, yeah. No, it's. Uh, oh, I hope this is. Yeah. Here we are. Oh, um, perfect. So, but it's, but but I I, I but the velo the velo but I remember there is some slip flow here. No, there is some slip. There's so, visible, sorry, uh, I didn't hear that word. There's some. Uh, there is slipping. The velocity is not quite continuous. Yes, yes, the velocity is uh, continuous. At the inter okay, at the okay. Interface, yeah, okay. the interface definitely. And as I say, and you can imagine, this is really quite a, an extensive uh, algebraic set of manipulations you need to form the uh, solution in the water uh, and then in the uh, coral layer and then mix them together or um, meet them together um, so that their pressure and the velocity is uh, continuous okay um, is that all right now uh, yeah thanks yes. Professor Herbert. thank you so much yeah okay well, and, and please do interrupt. It uh, always makes it more interesting for me and I get to know what I should have said and uh, how best to put it. Okay, well, this is now uh, a special case uh, where uh, there's as much uh, coral or porous layer as there is uh, a liquid layer, little d over capital D is uh, a half. And here you see, uh, K, the wave uh, number, um, there are two uh, relationships uh, where K satisfies the uh, dispersion relationship. And this is really just the contours of the uh, dispersion relationship. The left-hand side is equal to zero in uh, these two white starred uh, points. And so we get, uh, 0 0.76 uh, and 0 0.28i. So what that says is as the waves go over the coral uh, layer, um, that uh, they uh, are dissipated because of the energy dissipation uh, in the viscous lower layer of the uh, corals. That uh, changes the surface waves. And if I might just show you, you see here that it's uh, drawn here um, that the surface uh, wave amplitude, which I've written as eta, gets as it goes even through one uh, wavelength. It's just a sketch here. It goes from being relatively big to being relatively slow. That's because energy is taken up by going through this coral layer, this Darcy layer. There is a question relating that is uh, someone is asking if the the assumption is an implicit fluid. 
viscous. It, it's inviscid in the upper ocean and okay. viscous in the uh, porous medium, in the cor a coral layer. Uh, if you oh, like, oh, if because you, in, the, in the in the porous media, you assume Darcy's law, right? Uh, in in the porous uh, medium, I assume Darcy's law. Correct. And oh. what's that's really saying is the length scale that's of relevance in the upper ocean with the fluid is the wavelength, which is uh, typically many many uh, tens of meters. But in the porous medium, in the coral layers. The relevant length scale is just the the few millimeters, maybe of spacing between uh, the uh, bits of uh, coral, and uh, I'll, I'll show you how to measure that uh, in a moment. Um, but so there's a total difference in length scale, and because the the Rayleigh number is u l over nu, um, that the same viscosity. But the length scale in the upper fluid is high or leads to high Rayleigh number, and the length scale uh, is so small in the lower fluid that it's low Rayleigh number. Okay, um, so this is I hope will show you what the motion is like. This is now following the particles. Well, it was. Where's it gone? Here it goes. So you see the wave moves much faster than the particles themselves. And the particle motion is less in the lower layer than in the upper layer um, because the viscosity is very much uh, larger. So this is the particle motion. Should I show that again, Sasha, or was that once is enough? Why not? Please do so. Okay, let's see if I can just show it again. So I assume that this particle track is what, what you refer to the group uh, group velocity, right? Uh, 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 no, this is this is the, the particle velocity, if you like. Yeah, the group velocity. But you, you yeah. see the, the waves going on top. And the important thing is that the waves going on top are going very much faster than yeah. the uh, particle paths going on the bottom. OK. Yeah, very good. Okay, uh, whoops. Right. Now, here's some uh, examples of what it uh, looks like. Um, th this is for, uh, it should be little d over big D is uh, a quarter. Uh, in other words, uh, that uh, the uh, ocean is only a quarter of the depth of the total amount. And what you see here, the paths, and the important thing that you see immediately is that there is some vertical component of the motion. Not only is there a horizontal component, but a vertical component. And that's really very important. And I'll show you the results that we've calculated uh, now for all the different uh, depth ratios. And I'm sorry, in all of these cases, it should be little d over capital D. Um, the first uh, diagram, I've already uh, shown you the results uh, for. And then if you go to the top right, this is where the fluid layer and the coral layer are uh, about uh, the same, but still important uh, matter that uh, the, uh, there is a vertical component, as you see. Slowly, the drift forward makes for a vertical uh, component. You can see that in the next uh, case um, where uh, the uh, coral layer is really rather small. There's a little bit of a uh, um, vertical drift uh, in the top layer and not quite as easily seen in the bottom layer because it's squashed. And then in the case where it's 0.99, and this was really just to check out that uh, our calculations were correct. In other words, uh, the lower layer is really very insignificant. It's only 1% of the total depth. Um, we get back to a totally horizontal Stokes drift. So what we're saying is that putting in the coral layer uh, makes for a vertical exchange. And that's really very important um, for both 
the physical contents of what's going on and the biological uh, context. Um, oh, well, this is just a, a, a plot of the uh, Stokes uh, velocity um, at different places along, uh, showing you how it uh, decreases um, as you move along because the whole velocity is getting less. There's a discontinuity in the, the uh, surface. Um, uh, here it's at, at about, uh, well, uh, oh, sorry, the upper layer is, uh, the upper fixture is at 0.25, so outside, oh, I've, gone the wrong, oh, I've gone wrong somehow. Uh, yeah, the upper, uh, the upper one is little d over big D is I think 0.25, and uh, the uh, lower one is 0.75, uh, and we've just made them simple uh, lengths so that you can see how the discontinuous not in value but in shape well and here's uh, the uh, situation again for different uh, uh, plots and again the 0.99 uh, uh, meters is uh, really uh, just to show that you can get the same thing uh, as you'd have got before well, uh, now this is the vertical Stokes uh, velocity, and uh, you see there's a discontinuity uh, here, um, and so, but there's, it's definitely important because it brings up biological stuff into and out of the coral layer, and uh, um, also <laughs> cleans it out in some sense. Anyhow. I really got into this work because of uh, a woman called Mimi Curl, who's the biological oceanographer uh, in Berkeley. And uh, this is her research uh, group um, standing on a coral uh, reef in Hawaii about to make measurements. Some of them are going to go down and scuba dive in a sense. Uh, some of them are just going to uh, make velocity measurements uh, from there. And I've always thought this must be great fun. I've asked Mimi to take me once, but it's never so far happened. Now, what she uh, did is... Uh, uh, Herbert, can I ask you something? Yeah, if I could? Please. So you, you found from your solutions that there is a discontinuity in the vertical velocity at the interface. So, if I if I so the, I, I I'm a bit uh, well I, I, looking at that I think that that area then the 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 flow field will no longer be divergence free so there will be some compressibility or the, or some mass accumulation. Well, it'll be divergent free in the coral layer, and it'll be divergent. Free in the, uh, the upper layer, yeah. Upper layer, but there will but be then, transfer between those two layers. Correct. That's important. So, so in those cases, how can we interpret that? So there is, there, there is mass accumulating. What water water mass accumulated or something like that? Uh, no, no. no. We, but remember, there's a horizontal component to it also, and that takes it along, but there is a difference in the vertical uh, component yeah small stokes drift uh, velocity second order very small drift and it, it, i'm showing it to you here if you like uh, to show um this is now some measurements that uh, mimi coils group uh, made um they put some uh, dye into the coral layer and showed here how it gets taken up um, by uh, the uh, wave motion uh, above it. So okay. th that's the important uh, thing. And now, okay. of course, I, I, I've made a very large simplification to start with of saying that the coral layer has a flat top and it's all two dimensional and all very simple. And uh, since I was the first uh, person to calculate this, uh, I hope that's okay. But there are lots of interesting things uh, um, that uh, uh, could be done. What happens if there's a sloped uh, upper surface? What happens at the end of the coral layer where it uh, 
decreases in uh, depth. Uh, what happens if it's not uniform? There are lots of interesting things that can be done. But I might say I, I started this uh, work uh, because Mimi Coyle, who I'd known for some other reasons, um, came to Cambridge to give a talk. And she talked about her measurements and the things that she'd done and about the velocities that she'd measured, which I'll show you in the next slide. And I went down to her later and I said, Mimi, that was a wonderful talk. She's a fabulous presenter. And there are just two things I have to say. One is you talked about fluid flow, but in Cambridge especially, you have to call that a Stokes drift. You must mention Stokes. And the second question I asked is, has anybody evaluated this, done this uh, theoretically? And she said, no. So that's how I started going with a summer student, um, Joseph Weber. Uh, oops, now I can't get it to. Oh, uh, he's just showing you the, the corals that uh, she took photographs of and the length scale gives you an indication of what it's like. And as you see, it's bumpy. There's no doubt about it that my simplification of uh, just a, a uniform uh, thickness is uh, a simplification, but you have to start somewhere. And that's what I'm going to do. Um, this is now uh, her e experiments, um, putting dye down into the coral reef and the dye slowly flows out of the reef, <clears throat> uh, showing you that there's a vertical velocity. Um, and then once it, <coughs> excuse me, out of the reef and up into the ocean, um, it uh, goes back and uh, forth and it spreads in both directions. And that's just like what uh, you saw uh, beforehand in the uh, um, motion of the fluid. So what it says is uh, that there's a slow uh, motion, uh, both horizontally and vertically, and the vertical drift is due to the coral layer and the different uh, plane. And here, um, this is a typical uh, of what our calculation would uh, lead. You have order of a few meters a, a second that come down to being very much smaller when you get to the coral uh, reef um, because of the effects of viscosity and then a much smaller uh, Stokes drift in the, uh, in the coral layer and a vertical uh, drift that comes out. And it's going to, that's the average, but there's going to be some in and some out of the reef. So there are motions in all directions at second order. Now, what uh, we did is to uh, work out what the uh, permeability um, <clears throat> and uh, porosity of the coral would be by taking uh, some uh, coral, uh, pouring water in under constant uh, height, so it was a constant pressure, and then watching uh, at what rate it flows out of the container. So that way we could uh, make measurements on the coral uh, um, fractions. Uh, this is the use to determine, this is what it uh, looks like uh, in the lab. So you see, this is uh, a very complicated uh, porous medium. Uh, we're using Darcy's law, which averages it all and simplifies it all. And without a doubt, there'd be more complicated ways, but one would hate to have to follow the uh, flow through every little hole here, as you see, going through this one here, and then this very much bigger hole and even the bigger one here. So we're making, even larger here, we're making a different simplification uh, by using uh, Darcy's law. Okay, now, um, this is now for different amplitudes of waves uh, from uh, 10 centimeters to uh, five uh, centimeters. And this is our calculation of what the horizontal drift velocity should uh, be. Um, how it would uh, change. And these are their measurements. And what I thought was fascinating when we uh, submitted this paper, one of the referees said, yeah, but the experiments have error bars associated with them. 
and the theory has no error bars whatsoever. So how can they possibly be in any agreement? Well, <laughs> that's the usual story with the uh, things are not constant in the ocean. Uh, the frequency may change a little bit. There will be wind over part of the uh, flow. The coral reef is not uh, perfectly uniform as I've assumed. So there'll be some differences. There's no doubt about that. But in general, as you see, we're really not at all bad in general agreement. Okay. So the take home message is so far is the Stokes drift in the high Reynolds number liquid layer above the low Reynolds number porous layer has a vertical component. This has important ramifications for biological species, both because it can bring stuff into uh, the coral layer, which the biological species can eat, uh, and dead biological species get taken out of the uh, coral uh, layer um, by uh, cleaning it out by the vertical drift. Now, there's uh, no doubt, as I've uh, said a number of times, that the theory and what really goes on may have some differences, which make for quantitative but not qualitative uh, distinctions. The numbers, I'm sure, will differ slightly if the, the coral layer is not flat and if it uh, changes, of course, as it does in the permeability and everything as it goes on. Okay, for the next talk, I want to talk about uh, tsunamis um, because it gave me, doing this work gave me the idea of what to uh, do to tsunamis. And I'll tell you a little bit about previous work on tsunamis, a little bit about what we've done. Um, so extra applications, and then some uh, conclusions. So the fundamental uh, Professor, fact, uh, yeah. Professor, but, uh, just one question before you move on to a new topic. Uh, you showed uh, a picture uh, of uh, uh, drift woods where the woods have come to the shore in uh, flowing in uh, one direction. Oh, uh, I showed you with some, some uh, picture of, of wood coming to the shore, yes. Yeah, and then you showed an animation where the particles were, uh, drifting towards uh, the right side in one direction. And yeah. then uh, you also showed an image of uh, where the dye was injected, where the drift was in both the directions horizontally. So my question is, uh, what determines the direction of the Stokes drift, uh, the horizontal direction? Is it oh, the no. energy propagation direction or anything else? No, uh, that's an important uh, question, and I should have uh, made that uh, clear. Um, the Stokes drift will be in the same direction as the propagation of the waves on the, the top of the, the uh, surface. So if we forget about the coral uh, layer for the moment and just think about the ocean uh, uh, a, a layer of uh, water with a wave uh, above it, the direction of the wave determines the direction of the purely horizontal Stokes drift. So the fact that the waves propagate towards the shore means that the uh, plastics and the uh, wood propagates also towards the shore by this Stokes drift. You mean the group velocity? The, sorry? Yeah. Do you mean the group velocity direction determines or the, the phase velocity? But the phase velocity and the group velocity are in the same direction. These are, uh, these are two-dimensional waves. These are two-dimensional calculations. So it's, as I showed you right at the beginning, long waves, and we're not allowing any three-dimensional effect. So the, the waves are all going into the coastline in a nice uniform way, and it's a uniform coastline. Um, and that determines the fundamental uh, motions. Um, and the phase velocity and the group velocity and the Stokes velocity are all in the same direction and determine. Okay? Yeah, yeah, great, thank you, yeah. Right, okay, and as I said before, please always interrupt, I enjoyed that. Um, now, Tsunamis, uh, I can't remember how far I got, so I'll start from the beginning. Uh, tsunamis uh, can uh, 
be generated by earthquakes um, in uh, the ocean, uh, sudden uh, disturbances uh, due to tectonic plate uh, motions uh, generate uh, an ocean wave. It's just like a, a, any disturbance of an ocean surface which has a free upper surface will always lead to a wave motion and how the earthquake is formed determines the direction. There can be uh, volcanic eruptions at the bottom of uh, the uh, surface, uh, at the bottom of uh, the ocean. There can be underwater explosions uh, which uh, occur. And then there can be granular collapses, which also will lead to tsunamis. And the most important, well, in one sense, the most important one, uh, the possibility that uh, some of the volcanic uh, islands that uh, off Portugal, so in the uh, North Atlantic, could have a big granular collapse. We know that there are granular collapses uh, of uh, uh, volcanic mountains. And the statement made by some people is these granular collapses could be so bad that they set up a tsunami that propagates across the Atlantic and hits the uh, American coastline. Uh, and some people are very worried about that. The important thing about tsunamis is they have long wavelengths. The disturbances, the earthquakes and everything are such that they're long wavelengths, hundreds of kilometers, and can be of great heights, tens of meters, but they can also propagate um, at one or two or three uh, meters. But whatever, you see that the heights are very much less than their uh, wavelengths. And so it's definitely, or some things, uh, linear theory is quite uh, appropriate. Now, um, there was a terrible uh, tsunami generated in Luthia Bay in Alaska in 1958. Uh, there was a granular collapse on the seafloor uh, of 50 million cubic meters of uh, rock, in a sense, and that led uh, to a wave. And there was destruction of something like 500 meters above uh, sea level in Alaska. This is one of the worst tsunamis that have been known. Another one, as far as uh, damage to people uh, and property is concerned is the Boxing Day tsunami in 2004, which killed uh, almost a quarter of a million people and $14 billion uh, of uh, damage was uh, done to various uh, houses. This is a, just a, a joke. This is a, a, a large amplitude wave um, and the point is that while they're quite small amplitude, when they're in deep water, when they come up to shallow water, um, then the energy is mainly conserved, not totally, and it makes uh, um, for a large wave. And this is what you would see if you were on the surface and there was a tsunami. And this is just a joke. I saw this as a photograph uh, and I couldn't uh, resist showing it. What has been done in the past on uh, tsunamis? Um, there's uh, been geological investigations of previous tsunamis. Santorini, there was one in the 17th century BC, Crete in 365, Heraklion 1956. So there's geology in looking at where there was destruction and what went on. Then there was the uh, Numerical evaluation of propagates and speeds and sizes, uh, looking at what the effect of changing ocean depth is and uh, what should be expected. Um, there have been some early warning stations, but the problem is uh, the problem of the uh, tsunamis propagate quite rapidly and uh, that uh, causes uh, difficulty. Um, and then there have been walls have been built to protect shorelines, uh, to sort of dissipate the uh, wave motion as it uh, comes in. But here's a, a situation, uh, sorry, I, I can't see where this is because it's uh, above, oh, can I pull it down? No, I can't, but, oh, 
one second. You can uh, see because you can see see my screen where I can't see the total screen of this tsunami that came in from the bay here and and destroyed all the uh, houses that you no longer see. And this is uh, the Boxing Day tsunami, uh, which also did enormous amount of uh, damage. Um, now there's a ring of fire. Uh, where there can be earthquakes that are formed and uh, they do form and lead to uh, tsunamis. Another possibility, uh, could this happen sometime in the future? As I've uh, said to you, it's uh, said that there could be uh, a catastrophic uh, granular collapses uh, on, uh, off uh, Portugal and that would lead to a possible tsunami uh, coming to the east coast of uh, America, and this might be uh, what would happen to, in New York. Now, what I've been uh, talking about is how to actively decrease the tsunami wave size uh, and save zillions of dollars or even a lot of money and lives by taking away their energy. And the idea is, what if we, as uh, envisaged by the uh, coral layer, line the ocean with a porous layer. So the idea is to absorb the energy of the overlying waves and reduce their amplitude. Whoops, I don't know why that came again. Well, it's again, the same equations uh, as uh, we saw before, uh, uh, but the wave number K is going to have an imaginary part. And as you see here, it's going to be decreased. You get the same sort of dispersion relationship, but we're now talking about the first order uh, result, and we want to see what that looks like. And here now is the, the ratio of uh, the upper layer height to the porous uh, medium height, and the largest K is a function of J, this uh, parameter that I uh, told you before, K omega over nu. So the omega would be des described by the uh, the uh, wave, the frequency of the tsunami, the nu is the viscosity of water, and kappa is the uh, conductivity, the permeability rather, of the, uh, of the porous medium. And you could decide which J you'd want, where along you'd want to J. But as you see here, the best uh, um, value of uh, uh, K, um, largest value is along this uh, red line. And so uh, you want to use some function along uh, there. This gives you some rough ideas. Um, and with different wave frequencies, the two different wave frequencies I've mentioned here, two different depths, 100 meters uh, a kilometer, um, what would be the best uh, um, uh, por uh, porosity in uh, the conductivity, uh, 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 forgotten the word, uh, the value kappa in the Darcy's law, um, and what length you'd need to decrease the energy by a factor of a half. So if you had uh, in the order of a kilometer of uh, um, porous media underneath, um, you could uh, reduce the energy by a uh, half and of course that means that if you had two kilometers you reduce it by uh, a quarter and so on now how much that would cost i don't know but it's small compared to the uh, problems this just shows you the optimal uh, uh, for different values of s in other words different values of depth and uh, frequency um, what the best uh, J star is, the best value of K omega over nu, um, dependent on the value of S. And here again, how it varies with the uh, depth, the top red dot tells you, um, this is the imaginary part uh, of uh, R, in other words, the rate at which the distance it uh, is uh, decreased. And here's another value just uh, for a very small value of S. So I think the take home messages are that tsunamis can cause much havoc and great loss of life and destruction. 
But our idea is to lay down uh, energy absorbing porous mats on, or maybe just above the seabed. Maybe you wouldn't want to put it right on the seabed because they're fish and uh, 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 flora and fauna that live there. So you'd have it above and that wouldn't uh, be a bad thing. And the best possible porosity and depth of such mats can be evaluated. So you'd put in what would decrease the uh, energy of the and amplitude of the tsunami as quickly as possible. So that I think is it. Right on. Well, yeah, perfect, perfect timing. <laughs> okay. So, thank you very much, Gerber. Uh, there, are there any other questions for this last topic? Uh, well, personally, I was I was wondering. Of course, we we we, we could have this sports medium. And probably the, the first thing you could think again is, is, is the corals themselves. But then, uh, of course, we, we have we have you, optim, you you basically thanks to these nice analytic solutions you have you, you can pose it as an optimization problem as, as you did. Uh, but then, what, how how could we take into account the, the 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 resistance to damage of the coral itself? For instance, if we use coral for that. Because at the end, of the world, they have a finite resistance, no? For for how much stress they can sustain, let's say. So oh, that's an interesting question. How, would you break off the coral because of these? Yeah, for instance, they, would you break off uh, the coral? Yeah, the the no doubt there are some coral destruction, but on the other hand, <clears throat> in the exact opposite, in a sense, the difficulty of using walls to defend against tsunamis is if the wall is broken off a little bit yeah, yeah the tsunami can just get through and so the walls have to be kept in perfect condition and uh, whereas here the porous mat if there's uh, some problem in a little area of it the uh, it's badly manufactured or something that won't matter uh because it's the overall integrated effect that uh, plays a role and uh, uh, damage to a bit of the porous media won't do much. Uh, yeah, okay. Okay, do, do we have any other questions? There is one, yes. Can you read the chat box? Uh, well, the one that uh, a for shame of flow regime developed. It's uh, possible. I've used the simplest uh, relationship uh, I uh, can. Um, and I think that will uh, do, well, I'm sure that will do as a first approximation. You're quite right that uh, if you wanted to get really detailed situations, it may turn out that the flow is a little larger than and you need for Shamer. But I don't think that will be necessary. And it's definitely not a first order approximation. Okay, do we have any other questions? Yeah, okay. Okay, so I think we can end it here. Thank you very much, Herbert. And uh, we will see you then on Friday. Okay, Sergio, thank you very much. And thank the audience very much. Can I just okay. ask how many participants were there today? As of this point, 35, I'm counting, something like that. 45, I see. Okay, all the best. Have a good week, everybody. Bye-bye.